I first went to Bell Labs, I think, in 1967. I, had, I was at the time a graduate student in um, computer science, except it was before computer science. It was electrical engineering at uh, Princeton. And I was lucky enough to get a summer job at Bell Labs. But it was a wonderful place because there were an enormous number of really good people doing really interesting things and nobody telling you what to do. Well, that's kind of a rewarding environment. And so it was so good that when I graduated from Princeton, I didn't even interview any other place. I just said, okay, I'll go to Bell Labs. They offered me a job, why not do it? And um, that was a decision that was extremely lucky and I've never regretted it. In one single larger building, there were probably 4,000 people of whom about 2,000 were probably PhDs in various forms of science, physics, chemistry, materials, and then on the call it the softer in mathematics and the relatively new field of computer science at that point. Large number of really, really excellent people. And the environment was, you can do anything you want because the revenue source for uh, Bell Labs was very stable. It was part of AT&T, which in effect provided telephone service for the whole country. And the way it did at that time, AT&T was a regulated monopoly, which meant that they had in effect a guaranteed rate of return and they peeled a tiny piece of that off for research to improve telephone service in the country. That was the quid pro quo. And uh, because of that, there was no shortage of resources and no management direction that said you have to do something that will save the company in the next quarter. And that was really very satisfying. And so most people worked on things that were in some way long term, uh, or at least whose immediate application wasn't obvious. Hard to beat that environment, I think. And I think I was there for over 30 years and I was never once told what I should be working on. And the way it worked is at the end of uh, each year, you had to write down on one side of one piece of paper what you had done during the year and they used that to determine how much they'd pay you next year. I was born in Toronto, um, as almost everybody in Canada seems to be. And um, I went to uh, university at University of Toronto and I was there from 60 to 64. And then, not knowing what to do in the best tradition and not wanting to look for a job, I went to graduate school. And so I, I wound up at Princeton, I think largely because they made me on the surface and in retrospect, really a better offer than some of the other places that I had also applied to. And, and that was a very good thing. I actually enjoyed that and I met a lot of good people and by pure luck, I landed this job at Bell Labs. The reason I landed the job there, I think, is that the year before I had worked at MIT on Project Mac, which was the very first real, um, that was the beginning of the Multics era, and they were using something called CTSS, the Compatible Time Sharing System, which was really the first time sharing system. Um, and so I had a good time that summer, and I met indirectly, virtually, people from Bell Labs, and so I got lucky and got a job for a couple of summers. And that paid off both in future contacts, but also in giving me a <laughs> something to do for my thesis. The original computing world, original, um, a long time ago, certainly when I was an undergraduate, was that there were big computers sitting in rooms, air-conditioned rooms, behind counters, looked after by operators. And if you wanted to get something done, what you had to do was take usually a deck of cards, although perhaps paper tape, take it, hand it to an operator, and a long time later, you would get your results, which of course would be, it didn't work, and so you'd repeat it. Um, and so the idea of time sharing was to say, let us make it so that here's this computer sitting there, and instead of feeding it cards by an operator, let's connect terminals to it. And these were mostly, at that time, mechanical terminals, like teletypes, not even VDT types. And connect those and have the operating system of the computer sort of give you a few seconds or half a second of time, then give him a half and then give her a little bit and just go round and round the people who wanted to do some kind of computing. And because computers were even then much faster than people, this actually gave everybody the illusion that they had the whole computer to themselves. So it was unbelievably liberating. You could type some stuff into a file and it would remember it for you, no punch cards. And then you could say, gee, let me compile that file. And it would do that. And a few seconds later, the compilation would be over. And no waiting for an operator to give you a piece of paper that said your compilation failed, you found out right away. So then you made a change and did it again. And so it was incredibly more productive. You could do in a few minutes something that might have taken you a few days with the punch card paper operator kind of mechanism. So that's what time sharing was, if you like. 
So could you call that an early version of cloud computing? Perhaps you could. There's the central computer, it has the resources, that's where information is being stored, and you're talking to it remotely. Now maybe not very remotely, but given phone systems, it could be really remotely. So in an early sense, you could say that was cloud computing. So you come around full circle in some respects? In some respects, absolutely. The connection was that MIT had done this system called CTSS, very successful, but of course very local, and they decided that they wanted to do the next thing, which was a computing utility, which would provide that same sort of wonderful service to the world at large. So let's build a computing utility. And to do that, we need more resources of time, money, and especially people. <clears throat> and so MIT enlisted two other organizations to help them build this thing, which is going to be called Multics, the Multiplexed Information and Computing Service. One of those was General Electric, who at the time made computer hardware, seems strange, um, and the other was Bell Labs, which had at the time a lot of experience in operating system development because they had built operating systems for IBM computers that were not IBM. And so we had this three organizations, MIT, GE, and Bell Labs, in three different places. One was in Cambridge, Massachusetts, one was in Murray Hill, New Jersey, and one was in Phoenix, Arizona. You, don't have to study management theory very much to realize there are potential problems in this sort of thing. So they worked on Multics for probably three or four years, and at that point Bell Labs decided that it wasn't going where it should go fast enough, and they withdrew from the project. That was in late 68, very early 69. Um, but up to that point, people from Bell Labs who had been involved in Multics were, had you know, really gotten used to time sharing, understood that that worked really well, um, had learned a lot of things about how you develop operating systems, were using high level languages to do the actual implementation of the operating systems. So they got a tremendous amount of experience and a taste for really good computing. And so when Bell Labs pulled out, it left people, in particular Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, with a big hole. We like to do things this way, we can't do it, what do we do? And then you go off into this well-told story of Ken Thompson finding a little used PDP-7 upon which he builds in a month an operating system and the rest is Unix history. Yeah. At the time I was at MIT, which was the summer of 66, I did not know Ken at all. I met him, I think then when I spent the summer of 67 at Bell Labs and we were in the same organization and I think Dennis arrived more or less at the same time. I don't have clear memories of that. And then I went there permanently in the, uh, very early in 1969, and we were all in the same organization. And so at that point, I got to know them well and uh, still friends. Dennis, unfortunately, died several years ago, uh, but I keep in touch with Ken, at least sporadically. So that must have been quite something. Summer of 69, you're there at Bell Labs. Um, what, what was the feeling there? What was it like working at, at one of these places that's so well known for innovation? It, it was an indescribably great experience. It really was because there were so many people there who were so good and the environment was totally open and supportive. If you had a problem, it was you know, like the corridors of a building. Everybody's office door was open. You could say, I have a problem to anybody and they would try and help you. They would drop whatever they were doing. And if somebody came into your office, you could you know, try and help them with their problems. If somebody had an idea, they would talk about it. People would gather in the corridors talking about ideas. People would meet at lunch and talk about things like that. Everything was totally open. Certainly on the Unix system, although there were protections on files in the file system, people tended not to use them. And certainly the source code for the system was just sitting there and you could look at it. Uh, people had logins, but typically kept their directories totally open. It was probably foolishly open in some respect. But um, so if you wanted to see how command worked, you could read the code. If you wanted to change it, well, go ahead and do it. Uh, and so it, in that sense, was within a narrower environment, a precursor of open source. And had, in the jargon of a few years later, it was egoless programming uh, in the sense that I wrote the code, but if somebody else can do it better, go ahead. I think typically that didn't happen a lot, except by people who were working together. So no way would I go in and change Ken's implementation of something in the kernel. No, not, not, not me. Um, but I remember going in and changing uh, some stuff, adding a, uh, a subcommand to the, the editor, ED, at one point, just because there was something I thought I could do better that would be useful. And so that kind of thing happened all the time. 
So it was a very, very free, open, and incredibly, I don't know, wonderful experience because you weren't told what to do. You were just said, go do something. Someone says, you don't have to do anything. I'm quite likely to watch a film. Or, I mean, how, how, how do you motivate yourself if, you know, was it just the environment that was doing that? Or? I think part of it was the environment. The environment was so stimulating and there were so many interesting things to work on. I think in the background, AT&T, remember, was providing telephone service for the whole country. AT&T had well over a million employees. It was the biggest employer outside of the government at that time. And that meant that it was a problem-rich environment. There were just all kinds of things that you could work on. And so though, although there was nobody telling you what to work on, um, there was always in the background this idea that, gee, there's something interesting there. We could do something with that. And I think a lot of people, and uh, certainly for me, you would work on something that had nothing obvious immediately to do with communications, and then maybe you'd work for a little while on something that did have something, and you'd kind of cycle back and forth among these. Other people stayed fairly pure on one side of, you know, let me, let's do mathematical type research, and others were fairly hardcore, let's do something that's directly related to the telephone business all the time. Um, but remember the research part, although it was, call it 1,500 or 2,000 people, was actually a tiny, tiny fraction of the whole company. So in some sense, it didn't matter as long as this collection of people produced things that were useful. And they had produced over the years things that were useful. Transistor comes to mind as just something that was useful. And uh, some of the early work on lasers was uh, done at Bell Labs. Zone refining, which makes semiconductors actually practical. All of, the, all of these things came out of Bell Labs. And of course, lots of interesting things in communications as well. So given an environment like that and where everybody is better than you are, you don't slack, you try and keep up with them. <laughs> I never succeeded, but it was a lot of fun. The wisdom from Mergenthaler was you'll never do it, you know. Our fonts are not deliberately encrypted, but they are so compressed and so compact and in such, such an obscure format, you will not succeed. Richer and had mechanisms in the language to say, this is an 8-bit quantity, this is a 16-bit quantity, basically the care and int types that you see in the early versions of C.